Take our Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Pastor's preaching a message this morning that's entitled, King of My Life. King out of my life out of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 7. When you find your place, will you stand with me out of respect for the reading of the Word of God? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and the stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it is, a, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For whoso maketh thee to differ from another, for what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory, and if thou hast not received it? Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your word. I pray, Lord, that as we come to the time of preaching, I pray that your, your spirit will move among us. Lord, reveal your, your words, your way, and your will to us. Be with pastor, give him the words to say, give us the ears to listen. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Brother Charles. So we are continuing our study this morning in the book of 1 Corinthians on this Palm Sunday. Of course, Palm Sunday is Jesus' public declaration of himself as king to the nation of Israel. By the way, a fantastic study, uh, a, a public declaration that was predicted to the day in Scripture. Uh, hundreds of years uh, before it happened, predicted to the day. And so Palm Sunday is Jesus' public declaration of himself as king. And uh, as you look at the scriptures, you understand this, that the vast majority of the nation of Israel, they missed it. They missed what it was really about. You say, well, preacher, they had that whole big Hosanna and glory to God in the highest. How do you know they missed it? Well, because uh, just a few days later, they were all shouting, crucify him. They were shouting, his blood be on us and on our children. They missed it. I don't know about you, church. I don't want to miss it like they did. Because he still is king of kings and lord of lords. So what makes that difference where they might have missed it, but I don't have to? It's simply this. He is the king of kings and lord of lords, but is he king and lord of all of me? You see, it's easy to shout about his lordship. Hey, he is worthy of praise. Amen. It's easy to shout and sing about that. Submitting to his lordship is often a far more difficult endeavor. But the reality is that if his lordship doesn't frame your lifestyle, then it really isn't practically being lived out in your life. If his lordship isn't being lived by you, then you aren't living like he's your lord. And that is the simple yet solemn reality of the Lordship of Christ. Now, it's wonderful the way the Lord works it out because the Lordship of Christ is really exactly what Paul is dealing with here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. Here, he is discussing the living out of Christ's reign in our lives, and really, he describes how we live out the reign of Christ in one word, and that word is stewardship. Stewardship. Stewardship, uh, give you a definition, is managing that which belongs to another. Now, if you've been in church for any length of time and you hear the word stewardship, uh, many of you immediately will begin to tense up on the inside. Because for a long time, the idea of stewardship has been misunderstood by the pew and even misused by the pulpit. We hear the word stewardship, what do we think? Oh no, the preacher's coming after my money again. Coming after my money again. 
But the reality of stewardship is this, hear me, stewardship has little to do with your money and it has everything to do with your maturity. Steward, stewardship has little to do with our money. It has everything to do with our maturity. It is viewing this life and all that we have in it in terms of who gave it to us and why they gave it to us. So as we've looked at 1 Corinthians in our Sunday morning studies, the first three chapters have helped lay out a philosophical framework. We're called to be saints. God's doing something in our lives. He's, he's building us. He's taking us places. We've seen the primacy of the cross, the sufficiency of the cross, the power of the cross. Now, Paul is driving home how these beliefs should affect our behavior. We're going to really look at that this morning as we consider uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 7, King of my life. Look with me at verse number 1, if you would, and let's read it in unison together. Paul writes, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ... And stewards of the mysteries of God. Roman numeral one, if you're taking notes this morning, please note the authority of the king. I want you to note this morning the authority of the king. Paul is clear about the Christian's place. We are ministers and we are stewards. The word minister does not mean preacher. It means servant. And quite literally, it means a servant of a magistrate or a servant of the king. Paul says, when men look at us, you know what they should see? They should see a servant of the king. The word was also used to describe uh, what, what is known as an under oarsman. Those are the guys on the ship and their one job is to row the boat. This word does not mean captain. You and I are not captains of our own ship. We are not even first mates of the ship. No, we are the under oarsmen. We are given to row, and our one job is to row to the captain's rhythm. When the captain calls for us to row, we're to row. It's that simple. It makes us mindful this morning even at the outset that you and I need to know the voice of our master Jesus said this of his followers in John 10 and verse number 27 he said my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me you know there's a lot of voices in the world clamoring for our attention but there's one voice that matters above all and that is the voice of Jesus that is the voice of the master and if we are to row to his cadence, if we are to live to his standard, if we are to serve the king, boy, we've got to get to know the voice of the master. Amen. You know, as a parent, one of our philosophies is that our kids need to learn to recognize our voice and respond. I try very hard as a parent not to raise my voice, not to nag, not to nin, 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 all the time. Why? Because their responsibility as kids are to hone their ears to my voice and respond when they hear it. By the way, Christian, that's our responsibility to our master is to hone our ears to his voice and respond when we hear it, we are servants of the king. And Paul says it should be obvious men should so account of us. They should look at our lives and say, that Chris Westcott, he's a servant of the king. That brother, sister Laura, they're servants of the king. They're servants of the king. It ought to be obvious. Paul not only refers to us and himself as a servant, he also refers to us and himself as stewards. Stewards, managers of someone else's resources. Here, specifically, the mysteries of Christ. We are managers of someone else's resources. When we consider the authority of the king this morning, I think it's good for us to understand as well that nothing that I am, nothing that I have, and nothing that I will ever accomplish belongs to me. It all belongs to God. Every bit of it. Nothing that I am, nothing that I have, and nothing that I ever accomplish belongs to me. It all belongs to God. He owns it all, amen? 1 Corinthians 10 and verse number 26. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse number 26. For the earth 
is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He owns it all. He made it all. Amen. Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. Notice what it says. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. God made it. He owns it. And by the way, he doesn't just make it and own it. In case there's any confusion, he claims it. He claims it. First Chronicles here, First Chronicles 29 and verse number 11. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. He owns it. He made it. He claims it. He sustains it. He holds everything together. Colossians 1 in verse number 17. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. He owns it all. He, he made it all. He claims it all. He holds it all together. He gave it all. Did you notice what Paul said in verse number 7 of our text? For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou? What do you have? That you did not receive. Hmm. Everything you have, you have received of God. Including that last breath. You received it of God. Church, as a steward, we have to understand that God owns it all. He made it all. He gave it all. He, he sustains it all. It all belongs to Him. So let's get very practical then. My time, my talents, my treasure, it all belongs to Him. Every bit of it. It's His. He's just given it to me to manage or to steward on His behalf. So yeah, we do talk about money when it comes to, to stewardship. And yes, we ought to manage the, the financial treasure God has given us in, in such a way that we, we manage it to fulfill His will and to bring Him glory. And yes, that means we, we ought to give to the work of God. But here's the thing. Sometimes we think, well, God owns the tithe. He owns 10 No, God owns not just the 10%. God owns 100%. We are but managers of what he has given us, our time, our talents, our treasures, our relationship. You realize that wife of yours, she belongs to God. That husband of yours, he belongs to God. You realize those kids and those grandkids, they belong to God. They have been but given to us to steward, to manage. Everything you are. Everything you will ever be, it all belongs to God. And you know, it's good for us to stop and recognize God owns everything. I own nothing. You want to, that's, isn't that a wonderful thing? Let's say it together. Ready? God owns everything. I own nothing. Let's say it again. God owns everything. I own nothing. That means that car you love so much, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. That house doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. That opportunity to, to advance in the workplace or to, to have some sort of influence in culture, that opportunity doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. And He has entrusted you. With the life that you have. God owns everything. I own nothing. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to him. It's easy to like feel ownership. And like we, we own it. We deserve it. We need it. My kids have recently learned the rules of shotgun. For those of you who don't know. That's how you establish who gets the front seat in the car. We all know who the driver is, amen? But you see, when we're going to school in the morning, when I take the kids to school, and mama stays home with the baby, that means the other front seat is open, and that other front seat is prime real estate. <laughs> and at first, I mean, it was, it was survival of the fittest. Like, it was whoever got there first 
and whoever was willing to stand their ground the longest. But then they learned the rules of shotgun. And the rules of shotgun are this. When you see the car, you can call shotgun. You know who's really learned to work the rules of shotgun is little Miss Madeline. She'll see Emma running for the front seat. She'll poke her head around the porch and go, shotgun. I'll look at her. I'll say, Emma, sorry, baby. She called it. Get in the back. Get in the back. But, you know, they get there or they call shotgun or there's some discrepancy about who saw it first or said it first. Because technically you do have to see the car before you call shotgun. And whether or not you actually saw the car or how would you see the car, it was on the other side of the van. And yip, 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 yip. And they feel like, no, this is mine. I have done the work necessary. This is mine. You know what I say? I say, all of you get in the back. I ain't dealing with it. Because at the end of the day, I don't care who called what. The car's in my name. I'll put you all in the back. Hear me. Your life, if you're a believer, is in his name. Know ye not that you've been bought with a price? I own nothing. God owns everything. So, man, I've got to take what he's given me. I've got to hold it loosely. And I've got to manage it for his glory it's all his I don't divide my life into secular and sacred some belongs to him some belongs to me no it all belongs to him and I'm going to tell you church make a little application here there's something freeing about knowing your place I am under his authority we see the authority of the king we are ministers we are servants of Christ we are but stewards of the mysteries of God I am under his authority I am an overseer of his blessings you know what that means that means I don't have to rage and run and scheme and struggle like the world does that means I don't have to manipulate and work and and wonder and worry and and, and let, let anxiety eat me away inside because I know hey I am under the authority of the king. And my king is more than capable of putting as much or as little as he wants into my care. My king owns it all. And my king has promised to take care of me. So church, when we consider the authority of the king, we have to understand that my main concern is not how much I have been given but rather what I am doing with what I have been given. We see the authority of the king here on this Palm Sunday as we talk about King Jesus. But not only do we see the authority of the king, look at verse number two, if you would. Would you read this one in unison with me? The Bible says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Moreover, it is required in stewards or managers that a man be found, what's the word, church? Faithful. Faithful. Not only do we see the authority of the king, but you and I also see the assignment from the king. I am a servant. I am a steward. I own nothing. God owns everything. It all belongs to him. But he has entrusted me with blessings beyond anything I could ever deserve. He has blessed me with family. He has blessed me with friends. He has blessed me with finances. He has blessed me with enough health to be on my feet and in the house of God today. He has blessed me with a church that seeks to know Him and love Him and exalt Him above all. God has blessed me beyond anything I could ever deserve. And I have but one real assignment. Christian, you have but one real assignment. And that is simply this. Be faithful. Be faithful. It is required, not suggested, that we faithfully manage that which King Jesus has given us to perform His will and to proclaim His worth to all the world. That's a good statement to kind of let mull over in our brains. We are required to faithfully manage that which King Jesus has given us in order to perform His will and to proclaim His worth to all the world. The word faithful simply means to adhere firmly 
to duty, to be loyal, to be true in allegiance. It also means to be consistent in the performance of services. Faithfulness, church, is the assignment. Faithfulness, faithfulness, faithfulness. It is required of stewards that a man be found. What is it? Faithful. Now, let me give you two thoughts here. Number one, this convicts my heart. Because when it comes to the concept of faithfulness, how many of us recognize the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak? And it's easy, isn't it, to lose intensity? Man, we, sometimes we start so well. But somewhere along the line, we lose intensity. And then we begin to lose integrity. We'll make excuses for why we've lost intensity and why we've begun to fall back and backslide. We lose intensity, then we lose integrity, and eventually we lose interest. You know, Brother Josh talking about the 5K. I'm going to be honest with you. I have zero, zero desire. Now, at this time last year, I was running all the time. I was running I was running a 5K plus three or four times a week. I was all about it. But, you know, something happened in my life. <clears throat> something happened. We had a baby. <laughs> we had a baby. And I have, I've, I've gained some baby weight. <laughs> Ladies, it's a real thing. I, I feel your pain. I stepped on the scale at the doctor's the other day. I'm at the highest weight I've ever been. I've gained about 30, 35 pounds since the baby was born. That's why you only ever see a blue suit, because this is the only one that fits now. One day, maybe you'll see a different suit, and I've either had to go buy a new one, or I've got my life back on track. But somewhere along the line, I lost intensity. I was getting up at 5 o'clock every day. 5 o'clock every day. It was awesome. Not really, but it was a thing. I did it. It was a habit. No, it's not awesome. That's a total lie. I, it was never awesome. But I'd get up at 5 o'clock every day, and we'd go run or walk. We'd do some sort of cardio. We'd be, we were in shape. We were loving it. This time last year, buddy, I'd have been all in. But then, like, the baby came, and I told myself, you know, if the baby's sleeping at 5 a.m., who am I to wake him up? <laughs> this is a way that I can love and support my wife. <laughs> I got you, babe. I am willing to sacrifice for you in so many ways. And so when it came to the matter of running, I first kind of lost my intensity. Secondly, let's be honest, I kind of lost my integrity. I found many reasons why it was just better for all of us if I didn't. And honestly, at this point, I've lost complete interest. Like, I'm just happy growing old, fat, and sassy at this point. I mean, why not? I've lost all interest. You know, and eventually, Lord willing, I'll get my, get my life right. But, uh... It's funny in the physical sense, but how many of you have been there with your Bible reading? Man, you know, this January, we decided I'm going to be in God's Word this year. and We started with such intensity, and, and then eventually oh, our intensity waned, and we get, began to lose our integrity in the matter. And now we're four months into the year, and some of us have lost all interest in reading our Bible and praying and walking with God on a daily basis. Maybe God spoke to your heart at missions conference or some other service about witnessing, and we were careful to have tracks on our person, and we were telling people about the radio and telling people about this and that and inviting people to church and doing all those things. And, but, you know, eventually we begin to wane in our intensity, and then we wane in our integrity, and then we lose interest. You know, this thing that it is required of stewards that a man be found faithful, it convicts my heart. Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, so often, I, you know, sometimes I wish like, you know, this is, in, this is in our weak flesh. We wish that maybe we could just be spiritual Samson for a day or two, tear down some buildings, you know, kill a bunch of spiritual bad guys, and, and, and yeah, we did it! And then, like, we can take the rest of the year off. Like, let's just read the Bible in the month of January. Just get it done, and then, whoo, I did it. Check that box. We can move on. But that's not what God wants. God doesn't want moments of magnificence. He wants day in, day out. Out, take up your cross and follow me. The assignment of the king, moreover, it is required of stewards that a man be found faithful. And I'm going to tell you, this convicts my heart because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
But it doesn't just convict my heart. I don't want to leave you there. It also cheers my heart. Because I look at that verse, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You know what you realize when you stop and think about it? That God really has one standard and it has nothing to do with our capacity. It has everything to do with our consistency. You look at the parable of talents that the Lord gives in Matthew chapter 25. The first guy we see, he had five talents and he got him five more. So that's how many talents total, church? Five plus five is... 10. Look what the Lord said to him in Matthew 25 and verse number 21. He said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Boy, that's great, isn't it? Isn't it? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well, then he comes to the second guy. The second guy, he gave two talents. That guy got two more, so he had a total of two plus two is... Four. Now, my math, my math students in the room, which is greater, 10 or 4? Grayson? 10, right? 10 is bigger than 4. If I have the option of getting $10 or $4, 10 candy bars or 4 candy bars, I'm going to most of the time want the 10, right? Because 10 is greater than 4. But you know what the Lord said to the guy who had 4? He didn't say, we'll go to verse 23. Look at him. And the Lord said unto him, Okay, job. Good and, yeah, fairly faithful servant. You didn't do as good as the last guy, but you did okay. So I guess you can come on in too. Is that what the Lord said to him? No. He said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. So the guy that had ten and the guy that ended up with four, what did they get? They got the exact same commendation. Because the Lord isn't so much concerned about the capacity as he is about the consistency. God wants us to be faithful. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of things that I can't do, and there's a lot of things that you can't do. You know what? I can't give a million dollars to the church because I don't have a million dollars. You know what? I can't go to the country of Sudan or Indonesia or Papua New Guinea or Australia because I, I can't go there because the Lord has me here. There's a lot of things I don't know. There's a lot of things probably you don't know. There's a lot of things we can't do. But the thing that we all can do is be faithful be faithful. We can all be faithful with the time God has given us. Well, I don't have as much time left. Be faithful with what time you have. Well, I don't have as much talents as so and so. Be faithful with the talents you have. I don't have as much treasure as I wish I did. You have all the treasure that God has wanted to entrust you with at this time. Be faithful with what you have. Be faithful with the health you have. Be faithful with the car God has given you. Whether it's nice or nasty, just be faithful with it. Be faithful with the house God has given you, big or small. Be faithful with your knowledge. Just be faithful. Be faithful to Him, His word, His will, His glory. No matter the cost, no matter the consequence, just be faithful. And isn't that a glorious thing? Because at the end of the day, every one of us can be faithful. We can be faithful. Here on this Palm Sunday, we, we look at King Jesus, King of my life. We've seen, first of all, the, assign, or the uh, authority of the King. We are servants. We are but stewards. We've seen, secondly, the assignment from the King. What is our assignment? To just be Faithful. Look finally, we'll read verses 3 through 5 together. Here the Bible says, But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. Now this is good, so if you're a little bit sleepy, uh, elbow your neighbor and say, neighbor, I need you to help keep me awake. And neighbor, you can elbow him right back. Say, there you go, now you're awake, all right? So we've seen, number one, what church? We've seen the 
authority of the king. Secondly, we've seen the assignment from the king. I want you to see lastly this morning the assessment by the king. The assessment by the king. The authority that matters belongs to Jesus. Amen? The assignment that matters comes from Jesus. Amen? Well, I'll tell you this as well. The approval that matters comes from Jesus too. Here's the thing. You may not like anything that I do. You may not. Okay. (laughs) I may not like what you do. By the way, how many of us recognize I can justify everything I do? Right? I I can justify everything I do. Proverbs 21 verse 2 speaks to that. It says this. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. People even justify sin in their own eyes. Well, I had to because he or because she or because they or, well, somebody had to. No, you don't ever have to sin, but the way of a man is right in his own eyes. But the Lord pondereth the hearts. You may not like anything I do. I can justify everything I do. But I'm going to tell you, that doesn't mean jack. Because regardless of your opinion and regardless of my opinion, remember it is God's opinion is still the one that matters most. Paul reminds us again that we will give an account to God for our life. Listen to this thought. Our culture spends so much time pushing the idea that you don't get to judge me, that sometimes we forget that I don't get to judge me either. Paul said, I judge not mine own self. He said, I know nothing by myself. It's not my opinion or preference that matters. I will stand before God and give an account for how I manage the life, the family, the things, the talents, the opportunities that he has entrusted to me. A couple of thoughts about his assessment. His assessment and my assignment, I might point this out, that it is appointed assessment and assignment. In other words, God's not going to compare what I have to others. Paul points that out in verse number 6. He talks about him and Apollos and not thinking of men above uh, that which you should think. Not being puffed up one against another. Why? Because God gives different opportunities and talents and treasures to different men and different women. And I'm not going to be judged based on what God's given you. You're not going to be judged based on what God's given me. His assessment of my assignment is, is a pointed one. He doesn't compare what I have to others, and perhaps I should stop doing that too. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse number 12 reminds us of that. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse number 12, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. For they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Very quickly, you guys have listened so well this morning. Here's what happens. When we compare ourselves among ourselves, the standard that we end up using is the lowest possible denominator that we can find, right? I tend to look for somebody worse than me and say, well, based on him, I'm probably doing okay. Well, the thing is, they're doing the same thing, and they're doing the same thing. And so when we compare ourselves among ourselves morally... Uh, boy, we always end up choosing the lowest, comp- lowest denominator we can find. But here's the other thing. When we compare ourselves among ourselves in a service standpoint, we often give ourselves an out. You know, there are those who think, well, I'm just a half-talent person, and God's not giving me much, so I'm not going to do much because I can't do much and I won't do much, and I'll just sit here and wish I could do more, and, 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 and if only I had one or three or five or seven talents, and then I would do more, but God hasn't seen fit, and so I'm just not going to do anything. We sit like a bump on a log, and we just whine, 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 feel sorry for ourselves. Stop. Stop looking at what God's put in other people's hands. Look at what God's put in your hand and do something with it. If it's a half talent, quarter talent, tenth of a talent, do something with what God's given you. Just do something with it. Stop. I'm going to tell you on the other end, there's some like ten talent people. Fifteen, well, God's given me all these talents. You know, I've, I've done a whole lot. You know, I, I've been mighty generous with my money. But maybe God wants you to be more generous. 
Well, I've been, I've been mighty generous with my time. You know, I've, maybe, I've, maybe I've done enough. Maybe I've done enough. Or maybe that's why God has given you the time that you have. So that you could continue to be a blessing to his kingdom. And so very often when we compare ourselves among ourselves in a service standpoint, we end up giving ourselves excuse and cause to take step back and not give and not go and not do and not serve and stop comparing yourselves among yourselves. Look at what God has given you and do something with it. Amen? His assessment, my assignment, is appointed one. But his assessment, let me point this out, my assignment is also a passing one. Boy, this is good. The opportunity that I have today, I may not have tomorrow. The opportunity that I have to have influence on my kids is a passing one. For some of my kids, it's hard for me to to wrap my head around the reality that, that my time of influencing them in the home is far past halfway done. Is far past halfway done. Whether it's our kids, our grandkids... Opportunities are, 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 are fleeting or are limited. The opportunities to be generous. Some of us, some of us younger folk, p- people who are younger than I, the Bible says, remember the Creator in the days of thy youth. You know, some of us think, well, when I get a little older and when life settles down and I've made a little money and this and that, then I'll get serious. No, remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Because the days are going to come if the Lord tarries and the Lord extends grace to you where, you and where you will be in the words of Larry Petrie, old and decrepit, and wish you could do more for God. But you can't. And so do it while you can. Do it while you can. Do it while you can. Don't sleep in until noon. Get up and do something for God. Get up and do something for God. Health is fleeting. Relationships can be fleeting. I have said goodbye to people that I never thought I'd have to say goodbye to that soon. Do something with what God has given you while you have the opportunity. Because here the thing is, one day my opportunity will be over. James said in James 4 and verse number 14 that this life is is even as a vapor. It appears for a little time and it vanishes away. So I need to take the opportunity to do what I can while I can. Jesus said in John 9 and verse number 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Why? Because the night cometh when no man can work. Might I put in here, if you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, today is your opportunity to be saved. None of this other stuff matters if you've not taken the opportunity to be saved. Because it doesn't matter what you do in this life. You will not be good enough, religious enough, uh, well-liked enough to go to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the opportunity to get saved is a passing opportunity. And so would you be saved today? His assessment, my opportunity is a pointed one. His assessment, my opportunity is a passing one. His assessment, uh, my assignment, is one of praise. I love what he says in verse number 5, uh, and the, the end of the verse, and then shall every man have praise of God. You know, God wants to honor us. God wants to honor us. Get it out of our heads that we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and on the big screen TV in heaven, God's going to play for everybody to see all the times you let him down. Boy, if I had a nickel for every time I heard that, I would be able to give a million dollars to the church. Man, this thing of standing before God is not a matter of guilt, it's a matter of grace. God wants to praise you. God wants to honor you for the way that you live for Him, to reward you how He can. I, I've been in youth conferences where they, they'll, this is great, Brother Barry, they'll say, God's going to take the crystal river of life, and in that crystal river, He's going to use it like a, like a giant flat screen TV and portray all of your life. And I'm like, come on, guys. There is no condemnation. To them which are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Amen. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all our sin. 
I'm going to tell you, our assessment by the king, his assessment, my assignment is appointed one, it's a passing one, but it is one of praise. God wants to honor us. God wants to reward us. Let's give him something he can reward. Amen. A couple of thoughts and we're done. Consider with me King Jesus on this Palm Sunday. They missed it. I mean, many of them proclaimed him Lord with their mouth, with their lips. But boy, they missed it with their life, didn't they? As we consider King Jesus this morning and King of my life, I'll give you three thoughts as we finish. Number one, it's a matter of ownership. God owns it all. I own nothing. Number two, it's a matter of opportunity. It's required of stores that a man be found faithful. And simply, it's a matter of obedience. Faithful stewardship has nothing to do with one's ability. It has nothing to do with one's education, experience, upbringing, wealth, gender, or ethnicity. Spiritual stewardship speaks to one's character. And hear me, church, we are blessed to manage for the master. I leave you with this thought. Because so often when we talk about authority, boy, it's easy for our flesh to get defensive, is it not? Here's the thing. I don't need to protect my life from Jesus. Now, I, that might be striking, but our hearts have all been there at some point, have they not? Well, Lord, you're Lord of my life, but just don't touch. I got a good thing going. And we always fear the touch of the master is just going to flip our world upside down in a negative way. Here's the thing, you don't need to protect your life from Jesus. I think sometimes, now this is a true story, in my house, my children, bless their hearts, have taken, when they get candy or a treat, back me up on this, they will either hide it or they will label it. And they are primarily hiding it or labeling it to protect it from daddy. <laughs> there may or may not have been times in our lives where they would come down and there would be a, a, a medium to large size pile of candy wrappers at my spot. And a hole where candy used to be. So now they label things to protect their candy from daddy. I don't like that. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Oh, it don't bother me. If I want it, I'll eat it. Like, I ain't worried about what name you put on it. But here's what I don't want. I don't want my kids to think I'm a threat to their happiness. I don't want my kids to feel like I'm a threat to their blessing and their blessedness. Here's the thing. Some of us, you know, we've got all these plans for life and we're doing all these things. And if we're not careful, that's what we do. We put, we put Lord, this belongs to so-and-so. Lord, uh, you know, I'll be there on Sunday morning, but, but, but just, don't, just don't touch this. And just don't mess with that. And Lord, I, I'll be there. I'll even be there on some Sunday night. I mean, it's communion tonight after all. But Lord, don't, don't, Lord, don't, don't touch that. Don't take that. Don't move that. Here's the thing. God's not a threat to your life. God's not a threat to your happiness. God's not a threat to your blessedness. Jesus is not a threat. He is not a threat to your joy, your success, or your prosperity. Here's the thing. His authority is my peace. It is my purpose. It is my blessing. His authority is my advantage. And I'm going to tell you, Saint, here on this Palm Sunday, can you truly say, King Jesus, King of my life? I wonder this morning if we could take some time, come before the Lord. Let's place ourselves again under His authority. Let's take some time and pick up the assignment that he has given us and just decide that come what may, we 
will be faithful. If you're here this morning without the without Christ, this morning would you make him your Lord and Savior? It's one thing to know that he is a Savior, that he is a King. It's another thing to know that he is my Savior, that he is my King. This time of invitation, as God has spoken to you, would you respond to him standing together?